Now it's it's my honor to introduce our next guest. He is um, it's uh, uh, the Consul General of, of the Russian Federation of San Francisco, Mr. Sergei Petrov. And uh, as a brief introduction, um, uh, obviously he can he he's been part of the foreign ministry for a number of years, um, and um, but I think what's most important as an introduction is just to perhaps remind people of the role Russia has played over the last few years uh, in confronting um, this global crisis and the, the thoughtfulness, the, the broader strategic and long-term strategic outlook of Russia has been exceptionally important to mankind. Uh, addressing one, obviously the crisis in Syria, the situation in Ukraine, um, but also the potential for a collaboration and effort even going back to 9-11 attacks that Helga referenced it was their president, Vladimir Putin, who called immediately called President Bush to put down the nuclear armaments and make sure that there was no possible uh, uh, escalation of war danger. And so it's it's in that light that it's, I think, very special, and I think we're very honored to have uh, Mr. Petrov as a special guest today. I think we all look forward to his comments. And after that, we'll also have time for questions and answers. So please welcome Sergei Petrov. I hope that audio works now. <laughs> uh, actually, it was a, uh, a very uh, useful and um, very good way of communicating uh, with uh, the other part of the world and for the uh, for the city like San Francisco and uh, uh, Silicon Valley. It's not. Uh, something unusual, but I, I'm sure that in many parts of the world you have to travel quite far to give this presentation, and we are privileged to uh, hear people from different parts of the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends, uh, uh, first, uh, first of all, let me uh, express my gratitude to uh, the International Schiller Institute, uh, to uh, Madame and Monsieur Larouche, to Michael for uh, giving me this opportunity to meet with you today and um, to speak about um, uh, about what's happening in the world. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so audio is not. <laughs> yeah. Can we? Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay, better? Oh, well, I'll speak louder myself, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> I'm very grateful for this opportunity, and, uh, uh, and actually, mm, I would say that uh, uh, Madame LaRouche actually uh, did most of um, what I'm supposed to do. All the, all, oh, yeah, now better yeah all the all the hard work all the hard work uh, and I would say seriously that uh, she gave a very broad and deep uh, overview of the strategic situation in the world and uh, in many in 90 percent of what I uh, heard uh, I would uh, agree uh, we um, we are in difficult situation. We are a very tense and uh, uh, frightening situation, and uh, definitely everybody, including officials like myself or ordinary citizens like you, would um, would have to do uh, something to make an input uh, to uh, prevent the unfortunate development that uh, I think would happen. I um, agree with Helga that um, uh, uh, you would not be able, unfortunately, to uh, hear about many things um, uh, following the local media. Yeah, you would. Uh, it, it's it's natural. It's natural that uh, definitely media here is uh, uh, 
tend to concentrate, to focus on something that is closer to your life and uh, uh, something that uh, makes your day every day. Uh, for example, primaries. Yeah, we can. Uh, too complicated for us. Too complicated for us. So we'll now go, go deep into that. Uh, but um, mm, I think that for for a country, for a big, rich, and uh, wise country like the United States, it it should be uh, useful to look deeper and wider um, on what is happening in the world, not just in the United States. And in Russia, we we do try. Uh, to, to act like that. We have heard uh, from Helger, and you read it every day in the newspapers, uh, about many dangers that uh, uh, surround us in the world today. Um, unfortunately, too many. And uh, if you follow the press, it's 90% of what you read uh, in, in the media. And it's not just U.S. media, Russian media is the same. Uh, so you will hear about nuclear war, about terrorism, organized crisis, economic crisis, Ebola, climate change, earthquakes, hurricanes, uh, even technology that uh, uh, on one side is viewed as a blessing for all of us, giving some amazing opportunities in our life, but on the other side, it brings us lots of dangers, and uh, in, uh, even more dangers, I would say, than many other uh, challenges that I mentioned. Uh, there is a good word here uh, called disruptive technology. Uh, yes, it's, it's something that uh, could bring you to a breakthrough and give humanity some new opportunities, but at the same time, it could bring us more dangers, uh, more uh, problems even in our day-to-day -day life. And what is missing, and I keep uh, saying that when I meet uh, technology people here in, the, in, um, uh, in California, that we need rules. We need rules that will govern how this um, technology mm, is used, is developed. And uh, these rules should be national, definitely, but also international. Uh, because technology has, uh, knows uh, no borders. It goes across the borders. It, it uh, enters into the life of people all over the world. And I'm sorry, but there are no rules. There are rules for war. There are rules for uh, economic uh, crisis, there are rules for many things, but there are no rules for technology. Uh, but I decided that I will try uh, uh, not to speak about um, threats and challenges that, that are facing us today. Helga was very comprehensive describing that, and I am happy that she also mentioned um, one of the options that we, we, we have in front of us to um, address what's, um, what's happening now. And uh, this, options, uh, this option is very simple. It's well known. It's, uh, um, it's something that we, are, we have been trying to do for years, but there are ups and downs uh, in that. And this option is um, uh, cooperation. Is, trying to talk to each other and to do things uh, uh, together. And in particular, I would like to mm, give you something, uh, give, uh, to, to talk to you about something that, um, again, you will not uh, find in the US media. Uh, Helga mentioned it briefly, uh, but I would like to go a little bit deeper into that to give you an idea of what's, uh, what Russia is doing uh, in one of the mm, in one of the spheres of trying to 
uh, encourage more cooperation, especially cooperation in the economic sphere. And that's one, by the way, uh, is directly re related to another danger that touches, uh, uh, that relates to our everyday life. The economic situation. We, before we, mm, yes, I, I grew up in, uh, uh, in Soviet Union, and we, mm, we uh, were supposed to read uh, Karl Marx's uh, uh, writings. Uh, uh, a German philosopher, you probably heard, of him. Uh, and his uh, one of his concept um, is called materialism. Materialism. That means that before we. Uh, think of uh, ideology of politics. We need to eat. We need to drink. So economy is the basis for for, for everything, and that's why I decided to uh, speak to you about um, Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, I think that many of us heard of NAFTA. Probably not so many, but still many heard about uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership or Transatlantic Trade and Investment Par Partnership. But what about other part of the world, the former Soviet Union? Probably some of you never heard uh, uh, um, about what's happening there in terms of economic integration. Or some of you probably heard that somebody, in particular Russia, is trying to rebuild the former Soviet Union. <laughs> is that true? Uh, so I will try to give you a, a, a more detailed story so you will be able to understand it. And by the way, judge for yourself. So economic integration in the former Soviet Union. How it all started and why it all started. Soviet Union was dismantled. Instead of one, uh, in a, one independent and sovereign state, we have many. But uh, dismantlement of the mm, Soviet Union, and I completely agree here with what mm, uh, President Putin uh, keep repeating time and again, that it was a one of the biggest tragedies you know, of the uh, 20th century. Uh, why? People, people, mm, you have to live there. You have, you have to live in the Soviet Union to understand why we, we, we look at that uh, this way. Imagine for a moment that one day this beautiful country would be divided and would not be a single the United States, but many independent states with borders, with, uh, with the necessity for you to get a visa to visit your relatives across these borders, with uh, transportation disrupted, with economy divided, with rich states probably surviving, but not very rich states having problems uh, feeding uh, people that live. That's what exactly what happened in the, in the Soviet Union, and that's why we look at that uh, that way. So it was very natural for um, for uh, people of the uh, newly newly established, newly created, independent. Uh, sovereign states of the former Soviet Union to think about what to do with their life, what to do with the divided economy, with the divided families, whether we should wh whether we should start uh, mm, building some some kind of a union uh, again. And there was a very immediate attempt, and you know about Commonwealth of Independent States, but it was pretty loose organization. Uh, that was more political than economic. Uh, and just a couple of years after the uh, Soviet Union stopped to exist, an idea uh, came up that we should think about 
reuniting uh, the economies of, of the former Soviet Union. And it was not Russia who initiated uh, and who suggested this idea, despite the, <laughs> the common narrative. It was, um, it, was, uh, it was the president of uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Mr. Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, uh, who suggested that uh, we should look at um, the way to uh, better our economic situation by connecting back the economies, uh, the economy that was divided. It all happened in uh, 1994. So it's now, uh, we are now 22 years after that. I would say that Russia would be a more natural, um, initi could be a more natural initiator of something like that. Why? Because Russia is part Europe, part Eurasia. And uh, Russia, we could name Russia as a natural bridge between Europe and Asia. And by the way, we could look further. Uh, we could look further from Russia across the Bering Strait to America. Uh, just to give you an idea that actually our countries are not that far. Uh, do you know that uh, who is the closest, board, closest neighbor of the United States uh, uh, after Canada and uh, Mexico? Russia, that's right. We are just, we are just how many? That's right, 2.4 miles away, <laughs> to be exact. Yeah. That's right, Diomede Islands in in the Bering Strait. One is American, one is Russian. Uh, it was um, they were discovered 200 years before the gold rush in California by a Russian, uh, famous Russian explorer, Semyon Dezhnev. And, uh, and so I, I, I can say that uh, Sarah Palin was probably not that wrong when, <laughs> when she said that you can see Russia from Alaska. If you are on Diomede Islands, easily. Uh, back to the process of Eurasian uh, uh, integration. So in 1994, uh, Ms. Uh, President Nazarbayev, uh, in his speech in uh, Moscow's, Lomonosov Moscow State University, uh, suggested this idea. Uh, the leader of Kazakhstan proposed to develop a working union of the states consolidated on the grounds of the interconnected economy. At that time, majority of the leaders of the many post-Soviet countries were not ready uh, to think about the idea of the new union. They just got their identities, their sovereignty, and uh, many were not ready. Uh, that's why it, it didn't happen that quickly. It, um, it took, I say, 20... Uh, about 20 years for us to come from the initial idea to, to the union that we have now. Uh, but in the beginning of the 1995, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Russia signed an agreement on the custom union. That was the beginning. That was the beginning. The process of the integration was not easy. Over the years, different countries joined and left uh, the process for different economic or political reasons. Um, uh, uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, and uh, Belarus were always there, but some other countries joined and left, like, for example, uh, Ukraine, Tajikistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Armenia. And only after more than 10 years of detailed and difficult negotiations, that would be October 2007, 
that the Treaty of Establishing a Common Customs Territory and forming the custom unions was signed. Integration process accelerated um, uh, greatly after 2008, um, after the economic crisis, world economic crisis, because uh, um, we felt that um, it would be much easier for us to withstand the fluctuations of the world economy if we are connected, uh, economically connected. As a result, the customs union of um, uh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and the Russian F Federation was inaugurated in January 2010, and after a year and a half, in July 2011, it started to operate in full capacity. The custom territories of the three nations were merged into a common customs territory. Later same year, on November 18, 2011, three presidents, uh, uh, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, uh, signed a declaration on Eurasian economic integration. In this document, they acknowledge the success of the customs union and expressed their enthusiasm in uh, further integration. They were sure that based on deep economic and cultural ties between the three nations, further integration was relevant to their national interests and among all would promote the health and uh, raise the living standards of their citizens and improve the national competitiveness within the global economy. The declaration stated, uh, started uh, the movement towards the next stage of the integration, the common economic space. In, two th in January 2012, uh, a legal framework for common uh, economic space as a market with 170 million consumers, uh, the unified legislation, free movement of goods, services, capital, and labor was formed. The common economic space was founded on the agreed actions or in the key sectors of economic regulation, in microeconomics, in, uh, the, in uh, the competitive sphere, in the field of subsidies for industry and agriculture, transport, power engineering, tariffs, and the natural monopolies. Uh, the benefits uh, for the common economic space for citizens and businessmen were obvious. Entrepreneurs got equal access to a common market. Uh, they could freely choose where to register their companies and to do business without excessive restrictions sell the goods in any of the member states, have access to the transport infrastructure, etc. Uh, same year, uh, uh, Eura the Eurasian Economic Commission mm, began its work. Mm. Uh, thus, for the first time in the 20-year history in the integration process and supernatural permanent executive body with real powers in the number of key economic set sectors was established. So it took 20 years for uh, governments uh, to, uh, to become ready to give a little, uh, some of their national powers to a supernatural, uh, supernational body. Uh, on September, in, uh, in 2013, First in May, and then in September, two countries uh, expressed their wish to join the Eurasian economic um, uh, integration. Uh, it was Kyrgyz Republic and then Armenia. Uh, and uh, on October 2013, at the session of Supreme Eurasian Economic Council, uh, presidents of the member state considered the application of the Republic of Armenia and instructed the uh, Eurasian Economic Commission 
uh, to launch the work on a session. In 2013-2014, Eurasian Economic Commission um, and the uh, authorized authorities of uh, the three um, uh, founders of the Union, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Russian Federation, uh, by the instructions of the president of the countries, were conducting very active work to prepare a treaty on the Eurasian Economic Union. That was another step. Uh, the document that was signed on May 29, 2014, 20 years after the idea uh, was um, first mentioned, uh, consisted of almost 1,000 pages, uh, 28 sections, 118 clauses, and 34 uh, addenda. Uh, the treaty ensures free movement of goods, services, capital, as, uh, and labor, as well as coordinated, coherent, and unifying policies in the economic sector. The, I have to mention that uh, Eurasian Economic Union was founded on the principles of international law, uh, which, among others, include a principle of sovereign quality of the member states, respect to the specifics of the political setup of the members, ensuring the mutual benefit in their cooperation, observing the market economy principle, uh, and its functioning as a rule without ex exemptions and restrictions. On October 2014, an agreement on accession of Armenia to Eurasian Economic Union was signed in Minsk. Uh, and um, in December 14, it's very, very fresh history of the session of Supreme Economic Council. President of Kyrgyzstan signed the treaty of accession to the of Kyrgyz Republic to uh, uh, Eurasian uh, European Union. So on January 1st, 2015, a uh, year and a half less than a year and a half ago, the Eurasian Economic Union beca began its operations. So what we have today? We have today five members. Uh, it is Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Armenia, and Kyrgyzstan. It's over 20 million square kilometers in miles, you know. In my eyes, don't don't know, but it's two times two times the territory of the United States. It's 15 percent of the world land. Uh, population uh, joint population is 182 million people. Uh, the volume of the European um, uh, Eurasian Economic Union um, in um, numbers 2013-2014 um, uh, was 2.4 uh, trillion US dollars uh, according to the estimates for uh, the current uh, for 2015 despite um, sanctions and uh, uh, oil prices drop uh, the estimate is uh, 4 trillion dollars uh, the volume of industrial productions, uh, production uh, in 2013-2014 was 1.5 trillion, uh, about 1 trillion dollars in foreign trade turnover. The Union holds, already holds, uh, the first place in the world in production of natural gas and oil, sunflower seeds, sugar beets, potassium fertilizer, fertilizers, sorry for my English, uh, and many other things. Uh, in addition to movement of goods, services, capital, and labor, uh, the treaty regulates medical drugs and medical devices, transportation policy, agriculture policy, industrial policy, 
macroeconomic policy statistics. In future, uh, the plan is to have a single regulate, regulatory authority over financial market to harmonize the taxation, to unify public procurement, um, to have unified consumer protections, unified electricity market, and target for that is 2019, a unified hydrocarbons market uh, by 2025, uh, joint Eurasian technological platforms, uh, unified information uh, space. Just to give you an idea what what um, uh, union um, how union functions, there is a supreme economic uh, Eurasian economic council uh, that is composed of the heads of uh, the member states. It, it meets uh, uh, at least once a year. And the latest, the latest session was uh, took place uh, just a week ago on May 31st. And to give you an idea what uh, what uh, the leaders um, were dealing with at that time, they adopted a package of documents uh, that included um, decisions on the implementation of the free trade zone agreement between the uh, Eurasian Economic Union and Vietnam, which was signed on May 29, 2015. Uh, they uh, adopted the document on the basic guidelines for the microeconomic policies of the uh, Eurasian Economic Union member states for 2016-2017. They adopted a document on the start of the talks to streamline the trade regime between the Union, its members, and the Republic of Serbia. And uh, they also adopted a document on the concept uh, of the common uh, Eurasian Economic Union gas, oil, and uh, petrochemical markets. Uh, there is another body in the structure of the Union, is the Eurasian Intergovernmental Council that um, uh, consists of the heads of government of the members, and as I mentioned, it was established and functions uh, more and more actively the Eurasian uh, uh, Economic Commission, which is like a, a government in the economic sphere for, for the Union. There is also a judicial br branch that is represented by the Court of the Union. So I would like also to say a few words about um, about the, what's happening now with the Union expanding its international uh, ties and our view for the future of this process. Uh, the in, we feel that the interest to the economic union is growing around the world. And, that, mm, and we see that uh, international ties are expanding quite rapidly. Uh, we want the, our union to be an open association that is smoothly integrated in the global economy and serve as a solid bridge between Europe and Asia. Last year, as I mentioned, the union signed free trade zone agreement with Vietnam Issues of cooperation with China, India, Israel, Egypt, Iran, Cambodia are under discussion. The Eurasian Commission has signed memorandum of understanding with the governments of Mongolia, Peru, and Chile. Plans also call for drafting trade agreements with Serbia, as I mentioned, cooperation agreements with South Korea and Ecuador. <coughs> to date, uh, more than 30 trading partners of the Eurasian Economic Union member states have shown interest in creation of a free trade uh, uh, area with the Union. 
Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, yes, and by the way, just yesterday, uh, during the visit of uh, Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, it was agreed before him and the President of Russia uh, that in two years there would be a free trade zone between Eurasian Economic Union and Israel. At the same time, we are looking at a possibility of developing trade and economic times between the Eurasian Economic Union and other integration associations such as the European Union, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Association of uh, Southeast Asia, Mercosur in, uh, uh, in Latin America, APEC, BRICS. Uh, just at the latest meetings, leaders agreed on initiatives to have an international conference of, on, on the establishment of cooperation between the Eurasian Economic Union and uh, the European Union. The combined market of the mm, Eurasian Economic Union member countries must serve as a link between the East and the West, the South and the North. The free movement of goods and services within the Union uh, is aligned with the Silk Road Economic Belt uh, Initiative advanced by China. This project is ex expected to include the areas of cooperation that promise economic benefits and are of mutual interest for our countries. Uh, I would like to... Mm, finish my long <laughs> long presentation with a, with a, uh, words by my president that um, he made in an interview to a Greek uh, newspaper uh, and he said that harmonization of European Eurasian and Asian integration should be aimed at creation of a zone of economic and humanitarian cooperation from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. And it should rely on equal and undivided security. I would like to add that uh, the next step, and as I mentioned, mentioned in the beginning, would be to connect this uh, economic integration to North America. And frankly, I'll be happy uh, if it happens one day. <laughs> and on that day, I will feel that I, I was a good diplomat. And I made a good service for my country and for the country that I now represent interests of my country in the United States. Because our primary missions for diplomats everywhere, be it Russian or American or any other, is to ensure that we live together in peace and cooperation. Thank you very much. I'm ready. I'm ready to take your questions. Not related to the Eurasian Economic Union. <laughs> Please, Senator. Yeah. Okay. Well, first off, let me thank you for a very enlightening presentation. It, it, it was superb. One can't help but draw the comparison. One can't help but draw the comparison of the development of the EU with the development that you are pursuing, and uh, and that raises the question that uh, why the United States has been so confrontational is because they see the success of your economic union. And, uh, and there, this is to be thwarted if we're to maintain our imperial status. The question I have is very simple. Uh, does the sanctions, which I think are going to be terminated shortly, uh, do the sanctions that were imposed as a result of the Crimea uh, 
Do they apply also to all these other nations that have become part of the uh, union that you describe, or are they just applied to Russia? Um, first of all, I would say that um, um, that uh, yes, European Union is a, a pretty big success uh, economically, and it was our um, uh, Russia, Russia's biggest partner uh, um, in the world. Uh, our trade, uh, annual trade with European Union, amounted to 400. 50 billion dollars annual. It's more than the trade you have with Canada, uh, and it's 15, yeah, 15 times more that than Russia trade with the United States. But uh, but we know um, uh, that there are other economic um, economic integration. Uh, um, associations that are pretty successful. Take NAFTA. I think it's pretty successful, despite the problems um, uh, and discussions and uh, controversial things that were discussed when it was established. Now we can say that it's a, a successful union, and that's why United States is thinking of expanding this uh, um, uh, policy of. Uh, uh, economic integration, thinking very and promoting very actively trans-Pacific partnership and uh, transatlantic uh, uh, trade and um, uh, uh, investment partnership. That I think is is um, natural and a very reasonable way to do. The only thing that uh, um, what we think that uh, uh, we should try to make um, the process of this economic int integration inclusive, to invite and to have it as broad as we can, like it happens with with the uh, uh, Eurasian uh, Economic Union. As I mentioned, it is open association. It's it's open to everybody to to join. It, who, who, who wants to do that? Um, about sanctions. About sanctions. Uh, uh, First, um, um, they, they do not, they do not, um, uh, they are not related in any way to other members of Eurasian Union. It's only Russia that are under these sanctions. But sanctions are um, uh, first and foremost, foremost as um, uh, as uh, is is an an illegitimate move. Uh, it's um, you. Okay, you, if if we if we agree that uh, there is somebody who um, uh, who acts bad, there would be a, there should be a consensus. Uh, we have uh, institutions for for that. We have United Nations, and uh, yes, we can agree. Uh, uh, and uh, Russia participates in the sanctions that that are adopted multilaterally with the participation of uh, many countries against uh, something that's happening in the world. Here we speak about unilateral sanctions that uh, that were not adopted by the United Nations. And um, the effect, the effect uh, I think it's, um, um, yes, and to, to about the legitimacy of uh, sanctions. You you said and yes, it, it happened after Crimea become became independent from Ukraine and decided to join Russia. Uh, something like that happened just uh, uh, several years ago in 1998 in in Kosovo. Uh, the difference was that in Kosovo it was the parliament of the uh, of this new country to do to decide that they will become independent of Serbia, um, of Yugoslavia and of, Ser of Serbia. In Crimea it was people who voted for that. It was the uh, clear and um, um, uh, understandable case of uh, people expressing their wish and their right for self-determination. So that's part of the United Nations Charter. And that was exactly the argument we heard 
when it all happened in, in Kosovo, that people have right for self-determination. What about people in Crimea? Do they have a right for self-determination? I think they do. And that was their will, to first to be become independent from Ukraine and then to join Russia. And we have to respect their, their, their wish. And that's what, why, why Russia respected their, their will. Uh, so in that sense, uh, sanctions that were taken against Russia is also illegitimate. Uh, but uh, about the, I would like to say about the effect of the uh, sanctions. Uh, uh, I'll be frank with you, it, it was a very painful thing for Russia. And it is a very painful thing because Russia is, is, a, uh, is part of the world economy now. It's not a, an isolated country that would not feel the effect uh, of the sanctions. Yes, we felt it dearly. And uh, um, uh, you, we saw the drop in our um, uh, economy, in, in, in what, what happens to our economy. We will feel it for some, some time more. But in the end, it's, uh, I think it's like, you know, when you want to make steel harder, you put it from um, uh, flame into cold water. And uh, uh, I'm sure that that will what will happen to our economy, that uh, with the uh, pressure, with the problems we faced, and we are solving them. We are, we still we still okay. And uh, um, despite you know, some reports and some statements uh, that you hear, um, I would give you just a, a recent fact. Uh, uh, I think it was um, World Bank that changed the forecast for the Russian economy for this year and the next year for the better. Uh, despite that the forecast for the world economy, they changed for the worse. And that's, by the way, a very, um, a very uh, important point. What happened to Russia with the sanctions and to Russian economy? is not an isolated situation. It's part of the world economy. And the effect that we see now with the uh, world economy getting slower is partially, I'm sure, as a fact of the Russian sanctions. Is a fact of the Russian economy as part of the world economy becoming weak, weaker. Should we do that? I don't think so. I don't think so. We, 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 we ho hopefully we weathered a couple of uh, a big um, economic and financial crisis lately. It was part of our life quite recently. Uh, do we need another crisis? I don't think so. I, I think that uh, we should do everything we can to support the world economy. And in this sense, sanctions and counter sanctions that was was used by Russia as a countermeasure for what happened is very detrimental to to the world economy thank you so first of all I wanted to thank you for um, giving us that um, the history of the Eurasian economic Union because as now you, you know, said yeah, no, no, yeah, now you know the name <laughs> I repeated it so many times. <laughs> but it is something that we don't hear about here. And it's, it's very hopeful to me that, you know, to have that, to know that there, that kind of an economic union is occurring. Um, the question that I have is, um, you know, we are so isolated from the truth in, um, in what's happening in the world, and particularly what's happening in Russia, um, that it's only through this organization that we hear about the, you know, it's how close we are to a nuclear war. Um, and it's it's been my perception that um, that Russia and and Putin are particularly um, engaged in 
avoiding that possibility as much as possible um, and that it's our government who is forwarding um, that kind of a conflict and I just wanted to check in with you about is is that is that the case that that um, that Russia and you know as far as you know China are that committed to staving off this kind of uh, conflict um, thank you for thank you very much for your question um, I do share uh, um, uh, personally the um, understanding that um, uh, we we could be very close to a major conflict. I do hope that we are not we, that it will not happen. It will not happen. But if it happens, uh, I think uh, the big possibility that it it turns it turns to be nuclear, and we do not have something uh, like a limited nuclear war. It's, I think it's an invention of uh, some people who who don't don't understand the reality. If you if you ask military people, they will tell you that something like that doesn't exist. If it starts, that that would be the end of the world. And uh, my hope is that we have uh, we have uh, uh, many many more reasonable people in in the world in in this country in in Russia uh, that understand that perfectly and that will do everything they can to prevent it from happening. Uh, exchanges and negotiations between Russia and the United States of nuclear disarmament have been going on for years. And uh, mm, certain control mechanisms or the agreements that we have in place are active today. And uh, that definitely protects us from some uh, unfortunate developments. But we should think further. And uh, uh, we uh, think that uh, uh, definitely the destroying uh, uh, nuclear weapons completely would be a good thing to do. But would you talk to a partner who is uh, trying to destroy your economy on, di on dismantling your nuclear weapons or any weapons that would protect you? Probably the first move would have to be stopping the sanctions and then talking as equal partners and the ethnic negotiation team. But we also th should think of something else. Uh, yes, nuclear weapons um, have been uh, a biggest uh, threat for the world uh, for decades now. But is it the only threat? Now we have uh, conventional weapons that would bring the damage that is comparable to nuclear weapons. What about these weapons? Yes, we'll destroy nuclear weapons, but we'll have these weapons. Another thing, yes, Russia and the United States would be in discussion of destroying nuclear weapons. But what about other countries that have nuclear weapons? If there is no nuclear weapons in Russia or in the United States, but nuclear weapons in some other countries would be a balance in the world? I don't think so. There is a big threat that uh, terrorists would get hold of, of some weapons of mass destru destruction. How we deal with that? So, yes. Uh, we need to we talk now and I should say that there are there are discussions between the Russia and the United States about uh, uh, keeping our, uh, our nuclear weapons under control and there is exchanges and there is a control mechanism inspections going on with what's happening on, on both sides but if we think of moving further 
to the complete and comprehensive nuclear disarmament, we should think wider. We should think about other ways to uh, destroy the world and even technologies that, that, that I mentioned at the beginning. A, imagine hackers who will hack a nuclear power station that would amount to using a nuclear bomb. So we should think wider about the threats of, the, uh, of other types of weapons. We should think about other countries that possess nuclear weapons if we need to go further. But no tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I think people have a lot of questions right now. What is what it, what it is well, too loud. What is the official or working language within the Europe, Euro, Eurasian uh, Economic Union? That is my question. Um, there are uh, all languages of uh, the countries are official, and you, I, I can judge if you open the site of the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, you will be able to read it in. Russian, Belarusian, Kyrgyz, Armenian, and English, by the way. <laughs> not Chinese. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Not yet. A couple of quick questions. One is, okay, well, my okay. Let, let me start with this one. Then my uh, my mother was born. Is it about hockey? No. <laughs> no, it's not. I don't know anything about hockey. Okay. My mother was born in Odessa. All the years I was growing up, uh, I heard that Odessa was part of Russia. It wasn't part of Ukraine. There was no such thing as Ukraine. Now, I am very sympathetic to the people of the Donbass and, and eastern Ukraine. I don't see how they can possibly, under any circumstances, go back to being governed by the Kiev regime. And won't, will they not uh, return to Russia as uh, Crimea did in fairly short order? It's, it's, uh, it's up to the people uh, who live there, but um, uh, I would say that um, that's what I mentioned in the beginning of my uh, presentation, and it's true about myself, that we have families divided between uh, countries of the former Soviet Union. I have many of my uh, relatives living in Ukraine. I am 25% uh, blood Ukrainian, so at least 25%. So uh, I feel this um, these bad developments not just politically but on my own life. We it's difficult to communicate for people to move around. Uh, I think that uh, the way out here is to is to try to be good neighbors, to be good. Um, Good brothers and sisters uh, to um, yes, it's uh, something that uh, happens uh, uh, geopolitically. New countries, uh, some countries uh, disappear, new emerge. Uh, it it always difficult for for people to uh, the people suffer from that, uh, but. Uh, probably what makes it easier when you uh, when you continue communicating people to people when you do not limit the just government to government interaction uh, politician to politician but when you continue this people to people interaction and if you go to Ukraine and uh, meet uh, your uh, relatives uh, uh, in in uh, Odessa, Odessa and uh, Talk to them about your feelings. I think it would be good. It would it would be good for for, for everybody, um, and um, it would be very. It would take long long time. It will be take the whole day for for me to speak about Ukraine, 
and there are definitely no no easy solution no easy solution but uh, uh, one of the I think the basic principles is is despite any political differences any ideological differences we have to remain human we have to remain human that's the most important